It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Nitya Sambasivan. Um, Nitya has received her PhD in information and computer science from UC Irvine, and she's currently a senior user experience researcher at Google. Nitya's research at Irvine involved qualitative field work of technology use among several marginalized populations in India, ranging from slum dwellers to sex workers. Nitya's research at Google is focused on design for resource constraints by understanding new internet users in the glo global south. Her work at Google includes one of the world's largest internet access solution, public Wi-Fi in train stations in India. The service has over six million monthly users today. My notes earlier said 3.5, but <laughs> Nitya told me that it's growing and now it's over six million. It's probably higher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she has an impressive publication record with several best paper nominations at premier venues. Um, while at the same time, she has influenced the design of real world products, uh, receiving multiple impact and citizenship award at Google. Um, I'm very excited to hear her work in person today. Please welcome Nitya Sambasivan. Thank you, Kimiko. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start with a trope. Technology, particularly mobile phones, have grown rapidly around the world. Today, more than half of this planet owns a mobile phone. And as this chart shows, in this millennium, almost all of this new growth in mobile phones has been in developing countries. And at the same time, there has not been a corresponding increase in uh, socioeconomic indicators or basic infrastructures in developing countries. One estimate states that 1.2 billion people earn less than $1.25 a day, and most of these communities are concentrated in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Basic services are deficient uh, in many parts of the world, whether it's clean water, electricity, healthcare, education, and so on. Yet, there is a growing number of technology users this contradiction presents an opportunity. Mobile phones are typically the first most powerful device in the hands of many people around the world. So how can we leverage technology to solve these enormous socioeconomic issues? There is a whole academic field devoted to this bridging, which I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of, uh, information and communication technologies and development. So borrowing from Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, by development, I mean not just to grow GDP, but to promote human development, which is in choices, capabilities, freedoms, and lasting change. Interventions in the field of ICTD have focused on many well-meaning, important socioeconomic development causes, from maternal health to transparency in government to employment opportunities for low-income groups. And on the face of it, these are very logical ideas that bridge social problems with technological solutions. But there are disproportionately more failures in this field uh, than successes. There's tremendous technological innovation, yet most projects fizzle out in the software development stage. Some manage to become pilots but don't scale, and very few are actually successes at scale. And typically, by the time projects launch and iterate, it's the order of a few years and funding runs out. While there's no accurate estimate, the range of funding on ICTD projects range, ranges from hundreds of millions of dollars to tens of billions of dollars. Just for comparison's sake, India, a nation of 1.3 billion, spends $7 billion on healthcare. So we're spending a lot of money on projects that have mostly been unsuccessful in achieving their intended impact. And there's healthy criticism within the field uh, the World Bank reports a failure rate of 70%, and this is the World Bank, which is well-funded and has global reach. So why are most of these projects failing? I argue that one of the primary reasons why ICTD solutions fail is because tech designers fail to understand how to integrate technology into existing human systems. Too often, designers create new solutions and tools without an understanding of the underlying systems already at work, upon which they are adding, displacing, or articulating. And sometimes that destroys the relationship and the ways of life uh, that depend on that infrastructure. So developing contexts are often perceived as lacking, uh, lacking low-level infrastructure, and indeed they are. 
However, there are, there are invisible, underappreciated human infrastructures deeply embedded in everyday practices. Gloria Mark and others define human infrastructures as the underlying foundation of a social system constituted by the pattern of relationships of people through various networks and social arrangements. So in these highly unstable technological environments marked by economic constraints, these human systems provide substrates and alternatives upon which technology exists. And often they are subversive, political, and extend capabilities more broadly. They can help with enabling technology usage, which I'll talk shortly about, uh, getting technologies back on track when they break down or handling repair, and sharing limited technological resources more broadly. So here are some examples. Showing videos to farmers on best practices in agriculture may seem like a reasonable idea, but from uh, deployments on peer-to-peer -peer farmer video sharing, we learn that only one out of 10 farmers wants to watch a video, the rest nine out of 10 want to learn from neighbors. Uh, while edge caching high bandwidth content in low connectivity areas seems logical, uh, we know from various studies that Bluetooth sharing practices are thriving and enable content to move from urban to rural areas and enhance social currency. So human infrastructures overcome and manage several resource constraints. Technology experts broaden access and make technologies usable and useful to tho those with lower literacy skills. Sharing overcomes access barriers. Human infrastructures are resilient and robust in the face of network failure. And institutional human infrastructure is typically low cost. Here are some examples of human infrastructures that overcome constraints. Let me rewind to 2009, when I was conducting field work in urban slums of Bangalore. India back then had a population of 1.2 billion and 61 phones per 100 people with 69% literacy rate. And this is a slum community, which is the lowest income community in an urban geography. Yet there was relatively pervasive access. This is Rani. She's a domestic maid and a mother of two. Whenever Rani wants to swap a SIM card, change settings on her phone, or uh, use her DVD player, she goes to her neighbor who has studied up to the 10th grade and acts as an intermediary to the technology. In developing communities, informal help goes far beyond spot assistance, like setting up a router, and is a fundamental enabler of access for a majority of people. So in turn, access becomes much greater than ownership statistics. Uh, here's another example of how Sharanya, an NGO worker, the lady in blue, reads out from a printout on reproductive issues. One of the ladies was facing a health problem, and there were no PCs in this community. So Sharanya went up to a cyber cafe, looked up the information, took a printout, and is now reading back to the community. And there are several more research studies that document the role of community members in tech access, including ones by Jenna here. The next billion users learn from and trust people like them more than formal information sources. This is really different from the way we understand and conceive of systems in human computer interaction. HCI, like the name suggests, is typically concerned with direct interactions between users and computers. Many applications are designed for personal use and private ownership. As technology finds the next five billion users coming online from the global south, HCI has to evolve to understand these more complex human-mediated interactions and not simply extend its paradigms from North American and Western European user communities. My research vision is to leverage human infrastructures in the design and deployment of HCI solutions for low-income communities. What if, instead of starting with the lack of mobile phones, we started with the human ecosystem of Rani and her neighbors, of Sharanya and her community, and designed technology as a tool that amplifies, modifies, and creates properties from a broader human system. Technologies are tools which can make people more efficient, but tools alone can't get the job done, especially when there are resource constraints. So how can we consider people as interrelated nodes and not as atomic individuals? How can we leverage human hooks throughout the design cycle by understanding what the nodes are, how things flow, how to enhance those flows through technology? So you may ask, shouldn't all good ICTD projects do this anyway? We don't. Most ICTD projects are centered on technology, and no one really thinks about human infrastructures. They typically build, uh, we typically build a solution in a lab and deploy it in a faraway country, and at best we partner with NGOs for deployment and operations. 
Now, uh, the problem is that the technology is innovative and efficient, but it does not always enhance or strengthen the underlying human system. And many projects end up as failed endeavors. So my goal is to make human infrastructures first-class citizens of HCI and ICTD, to spur a new agenda and vocabulary around designing for developing communities that is in line with their social cultural practices. So borrowing from Starr and Bauker, if we apply infrastructural inversion uh, to human systems, some of the analytical questions we can ask are, who are the people, what are their roles and responsibilities and relations, what are the agencies, what are the limits, it could be peers, community members, NGO workers, governments, institutions, how does information flow, where does it originate from, what are the forms of access, what are the values and politics, what are motivations and tensions? Uh, what are material and non-material resources? And what are constraints and capabilities? And of course, with any human system amplification, uh, one has to consider whether they are disrupting existing social relations or exacerbating social inequalities. Some of the HCI design parameters which human infrastructures could shape or translate into include features, content curation and filtering, delivery of the services, onboarding and education and usage. So the core questions in the research that I'll share today are, what are various social, cultural, and tech political factors that affect technological access and usage in low resource communities? How can design leverage these existing human infrastructures? And how can we conceptualize HCI constructs in low resource contexts? So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to share three studies from prior work and early results that touch upon uh, design for human infrastructures. My first study is on intermediated technology usage in Bangalore. My second study is about designing for dual lives of urban sex workers and how we strengthen and ride on an existing resilient social system. My third work is about the soon to be the world's largest public Wi-Fi network uh, on introducing a new access infrastructure with human intermediaries. And finally, I will share some early results on crisis response during the Chennai floods when an emergent human infrastructure responded to the crisis needs. My main messages are, technologies are often socially used, overcoming access literacy and sociocultural constraints. Trusted actors can be leveraged in system design, especially in stigmatized and marginalized <coughs> communities. New technologies can be colored by prior technological experiences, and human intermediaries can help make them inter uh, relatable. Emergent, gap-filling human infrastructures are efficient yet lossy, and technologies reinforce digital inequalities, especially in developing contexts. So on to the first one. Um, my core research questions here are how, can, how are technological benefits extended in a slum community, what are the various roles and relations in constituting usage? And what are the various interactions, exchanges, and purposes of mediated use? So I conducted field work in two slums in Bangalore. Uh, I employed interviews, surveys, photo diaries, personas, spoke to 22 women uh, who were all domestic workers. And uh, most of them were not formally educated. Three of them had studied up to high school. Uh, I limit the focus to women here in order to understand the complex interplay between technology access and social order. So in this community, only 36% of the women I spoke to owned mobile phones, whereas 82% of the men owned their devices, and many husbands took their phones to work. So here's an entrance to one of the slums. Uh, there's a temple to the right and the first house to the left, and the passageway leads you to different houses, and as you can see, it's a very cramped space. Uh, each household was only about 100 to 200 square feet, and that's like 10 times the size of this podium. Uh, with uh, doors being open and uh, people sitting in passageways, water taps, temples, and resulting in a very highly social environment that is geographically shaped. Infrastructures in these slums are discontinuous and unstable with frequent power cuts. The most common device was the ubiquitous low-end Nokia phone. Uh, radios and TVs were shared across households. So intermediation here enables technology usage through third parties acting as bridges. It coexists with direct one-to-one -one interactions. 
The intermediary user is one who possesses technology skills and help out um, usage on behalf of others. The beneficiary user derives value from uh, the interaction who typically does not have the technology skills or is affected by financial constraints or sociocultural constraints. So as this figure shows, the beneficiary user has to interact with the intermediary, but who in turn has to deal with the device user interface. And by user interface, I don't just mean a screen, but a broader socio-technical system. Let's look at how it takes place. Here are some examples from my field work. There are many variations of how, how intermediation happens. Surrogate usage is when the technology is not available in a community, yet the intermediary is resourceful enough to find it outside of the community, providing a last mile, uh, like the NGO worker Sharanya. Uh, we also notice that she is converting the form of information from uh, text on a browser to a printout to then audio. In proximate enabling, technology may be owned by the intermediary, but she may not know how to use it. In this case, uh, Lakshmi helps her mother watch movies on the TV using the DVD player at the end of a long day of works. And she hides the complexity of the user interface, in, interface from her mother, making it more usable. So I posit that intermediation will continue to exist in low resource communities. Therefore, the question is, how can we design systems differently uh, to better support these interactions? Direct interactions allow anytime, anywhere usage of devices. In contrast, intermediated interactions are limited by the availability of the intermediary user. Usability is traditionally concerned with ease of use of apps and software, but now it's also concerned with usability of the technology towards the beneficiary and the social relationship between the intermediary and the beneficiary. Designers have to account for multiple users and symmetrical engagement across the various parties. Uh, including privacy, persistence across a changing set of users. So in summary, the phenomenon of intermediation pulls apart a standard notion of the user into intermediary and beneficiary, and there could be multiple of each. A user may not necessarily be the owner of a device. Users show great amounts of resourcefulness and agency. A gift economy is seen here. A notion of reciprocity is maintained through other types of interactions. Forms of subversion are also seen, uh, where women not only borrowed, but also sought the help of their neighbors and employers in fulfilling their communication needs. And finally, usage is much greater than what ownership statistics like subscriptions reflect. So my next research study is about designing a phone broadcasting system for microfinance and healthcare among urban sex workers in India. Can technology play a role in improving outreach to a marginalized community, accounting for their unique lifestyle considerations? In our research, we designed, implemented, and evaluated a phone broadcasting system to help an organization run by sex workers for sex workers called Pragati reach out better to its members. The system was designed keeping the unique lifestyle issues of the sex workers in mind, such as not revealing their identities, migration in addition to other developing context constraints like low literacy and cost issues. The research is the first of its kind to examine design of tech for low income stigmatized populations and learnings from the study could apply to non-legal immigrant communities, LGBTQ in some context and other invisible and nervous populations. So why is urban sex workers? They are a unique and challenging group in that they represent a highly vulnerable and economically poor, yet socially stigmatized population fa facing issues from police, pimps, and society. But despite their socioeconomic challenges, urban sex workers are a leading edge case when it comes to technology. There's about 97% penetra percent penetration of mobile phones with the remaining three phones, percent phones being lost um, or stolen among the Bangalore sex workers as reported by Pragati uh, with individual ownership. Now compare this to the average Indian intelligence of 61% at that time and the barriers uh, in the previous study that women face. So initially I spent three months in the premises of the NGO, uh, drop-in shelters and uh, hung out with the sex workers and the staff in uh, also the so solicitation locations. Um, for the system design and evaluation, I used usability studies, interviews, financial portfolios, and medical records, and phone logs. Um, I did not record voices or collect any identifying information. All photos are blurred here. I did not enter homes of sex workers in order to respect their identities. 
uh, word on legality. In India, it is legal to exchange sex for money. It is illegal to solicit in public places. But in reality, it's a gray area subject to harassment by police. So what does a day in the life of a sex worker look like? Jaya is a typical sex worker. She's 35 years old, married with two kids, and leads a double life. Her family thinks she works in the garments industry uh, during the day, but in reality, Jaya is courting customers on the streets of Bangalore. Um, at night, she goes home to her husband and children. And Jaya has maintained this dual identity for a decade. She owns two phones, one for professional work and for uh, another for home. And her more professional phone is switched off when, and hidden in her purse when she's at home. The home phone is freely shared with family members. The mobile is a nodal point in her day-to-day -day communications, and she visits Pragati, the NGO, for catching up with her friends and to get health information. So Project Pragati um, is a healthcare project targeted at urban sex workers in Bangalore, but they also provide other services, such as microfinance loans and counseling. And at a grassroots level, Pragati's field workers go out to the field to administer services. Also known as Jeevikas, these field workers are senior sex workers themselves who practice in their free time. They're chosen from the community based on their friendliness and expertise. Uh, they visit the field regularly when other sex workers are practicing and um, distribute condoms, monitor health checkups, collect loan payments. So this is a fantastic existing system upon, uh, built upon regular interaction and high trust levels. However, the Jeevikas uh, system poses a logistical challenge because sex workers are usually busy and not always available. Information does not reach everybody since dissemination is not instantaneous because it is manually done. So we set out with the goal of trying to improve this information outreach using technology. Based on the interviews and observations, two domains seem to lend themselves to design. Medical testing, where sex workers were encouraged to get tested every one to three months. Uh, but would not show up because many of the STDs are non-symptomatic. Um, and microfinance, sex workers borrow small loans from the organization and um, often forgot the repayment deadlines, which led to some steep penalties. So from the research, there were some considerations to keep in mind for the design. Sex workers maintain dual identities, and this flows into their technology usage. Often there are two mobile phones or two SIM cards that are maintained. Um, this means the work identity is invisible and safeguarded, and multiple devices are maintained. And because of the flexible working hours when sex work is actually carried out, timing is a crucial factor when it comes to design. Intervening at the wrong time could jeopardize their carefully guarded identity. So based on the study findings, we decided to build a phone-based uh, phone server-side infrastructure to avoid software compatibility issues with feature phones. Um, but we wanted to amplify the existing social system and not disrupt or circumvent it. So we recorded audio messages to overcome literacy, to surpass literacy issues. We recorded audio messages using the voice of the NGO coordinator, Geeta, um, a, a lady who was much loved and popular among the community. We kept the calls short to fit into the busy lifestyles of the sex workers uh, and found a good time window to call just between 4 to 7 p.m. when the home-based sex workers were going home and the street-based sex workers were coming for the night. Basically, our system uh, was built using asterisk and uh, Python scripts. It would call up a series of numbers and play a, a, a recorded message when they picked up the phone. So to test the system, we deployed it across four different areas. Reminders for a drop-in shelter inauguration, Reminders for a microfinance loan, reminders for HIV testing, and announcements for a computer training session. Every deployment was complementary to the existing information uh, dissemination system through the GVCAS, except for the computer training announcements, which was solely done through our broadcasting system. So taking a cue from large advertising campaigns, we initially thought the voice of film stars or popular personalities would be more effective in communicating the message given the adulation of film stars in South Asia. However, given the sensitive nature of the content, we found a strong proclivity towards Geeta's voice, Geeta, the NGO coordinator. Here's a sample message on medical testing. Geeta first introduces herself, and then she mentions the various location and days for conducting health camps. 
Um, upon the advice of the field workers, we decided to model the message based on public service announcements on radio, um, which are impactful but non-specific to the individual. For example, we mentioned we will conduct blood tests and health exams as opposed to HIV testing uh, in case an unintended family member picks up the call. So we connected with 82% of the sex workers we called. 80% of them listened to the content entirely. We learned that short, interesting messages got through better than longer messages. We learned that users negotiated phone availability on their own terms. Uh, that is, we did not hear accounts of intrusion or privacy. Anchoring with the NGO helped us gain trusted paths. Members felt taken care of. Uh, we learned there was word of mouth diffusion. Uh, for example, five out of 68 members showed up at the computer training who were not directly called. So in the words of one of the participants, if not for the voice of Geeta Madam, I would not be sure. We know her and respect her. If it was someone else, I would be really suspicious. I took the message seriously only because of Madam. So while sex workers are a unique group, uh, they are a technology-heavy user group. This may help us augur possibilities for other user groups that are increasingly beginning to use the mobile phone as a personal communication device. Phone numbers are increasingly used as identities, whether it is in new app account creation, mobile internet, or mobile banking. But mobile phones are fluid and ever-changing or tend to get lost or stolen. Uh, in the case of sex workers, they're especially forked for a separate identity. This alerts us to challenges in using mobile numbers as identities in approachability and the permanence. Uh, leveraging field workers in the design, design of the system helped us build a trustworthy and efficient system. So my next case study is that of designing public access in train stations in India using intermediaries. Indian Railways is the world's third largest rail network, running through the length and the breadth of the country, as you can see in the schematic. It has a footfall of 20 million people per day. Indian trains are used by the entire social class spectrum, uh, from the very poor uh, who travel without tickets to the very wealthy who travel in air-conditioned compartments. We, Google, had the opportunity to leverage Railwire, which is an internet service uh, provider, Railtel's um, uh, existing fiber network uh, through the stations to lay access points and create a user experience. So the challenge was how can we design an inclusive public access service for 1.3 billion people who may be passing through these stations? We had to take into account the vast diversity of languages, literacies, devices, prior experience with Wi-Fi, regional differences, economic aspects from those who never went to school to those who've been through formal education. So I conducted field research in the various cities of India, interviewing people at train stations and hanging out, talking to passengers, relatives, friends, and family who dropped off passengers, staff, kiosk owners, and so on. Um, and uh, we designed and rapidly iterated our system based on feedback. Once it was deployed, we conducted large-scale uh, system evaluations of how the technology was being used. Very quickly. I learned that designing Wi-Fi was not just about deploying networks, but about the end-to-end -end experience of them. India has attracted huge investments in public Wi-Fi from Facebook's Express Wi-Fi, Google, Microsoft TV, White Spaces, and the Digital India platform. But India is a mobile first nation, which means most people come online for the first time using a mobile phone, and only 20 million households have access to broadband at home. And so most people have never experienced Wi-Fi Despite public Wi-Fi being nascent and relatively scarce, uh, news media and popular culture strongly influenced imaginaries around Wi-Fi. Prior technology cultures like Bluetooth from feature phones, social norms, and secondhand experiences led to specific fears and concerns. Contrary to many ICTD studies that talk about the lengths that people go to to acquire free of charge services and content, the free element of Wi-Fi was not sufficient to switch from 2G, a low-speed network, uh, because it was seen as adequate for most social media needs, familiar and predictable. Radiation concerns on Wi-Fi were discussed on social media through WhatsApp forwards and news items. Phone wipeouts from uh, prior experiences of content sharing uh, also influenced public Wi-Fi conceptions. And these are carryover fears from prior technological cultures. So for us as designers, we had to address these fears and concerns. 
Since the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks, uh, Indian regulation requires all users of public access to verify their identity through a process known as Know Your Customer or KYC. Usually for public Wi-Fi, it is done through a captive portal, which is an interstitial in which you enter your phone number and you get an access code through an SMS and then you enter the code back again. And it allows you into the network. Now, while KYC or Know Your Customer is a requirement, it causes concerns, particularly among women. Uh, when we spoke to female passengers, we heard a strong hesitation about entering phone numbers. So a little bit of context here. In 2012, there was a gruesome gang rape incident in uh, New Delhi. And since then, sexual harassment has been a lot more in the public discourse and consciousness and gets reported a lot in news media. While sexual harassment happens throughout the world, it is m much more pronounced in India where the online meets the offline in unexpected ways. In 2016, a lady's profile picture on Facebook was morphed into adult content and she faced stigma from her society and committed suicide eventually. So the concerns of personal identity protection and giving away mobile phone numbers are very real and rational. Our design challenge was how can we make women and minorities feel safe and welcomed in our user experience, even if we can't really solve the underlying sexual harassment issue. From research on the context, train stations are extremely crowded and busy with more people than their seating areas. Passengers are there first and foremost to catch trains. Sounds obvious, but it is the number one thing that they're coming there for. And we have to keep that in mind. Train schedules keep changing, platforms keep changing. Uh, pa pa passengers are on high alert to catch the trains uh, through multiple modalities of audio, video, and visuals like you see here. So our system had to be extremely quick to access and easy to use. Businesses in the train stations, like this bookseller here, are critical nodes in the information flow. So when I was at the station, a gentleman left his child behind and uh, while he had to go use the restroom uh, with a complete stranger, that is the bookseller. Passengers walk up to these kiosk owners to ask them questions on timings, platforms, places to, stay, places to see in their destinations. Sometimes walking up to an of uh, official or an information booth there was very high comfort levels with approaching uh, kiosks or people from the same social class. So how could we leverage this rich human infrastructure? So with all these challenges in mind that came up from extensive field research, our approach was twofold. We built a simple intuitive login experience. We leveraged human infrastructures in the train stations. First, I'm gonna talk about the system design. So this is what the UI looks like. Uh, you enter your phone number, you receive an SMS with a four-digit access code, and you enter it back here, and you're online. Seems simple, right? Took us a lot of iterations to get there. To make our experience easy for low literate users, we limited uh, text and added visuals, uh, like this fail page of a man running after a train, which is a very common scenario. To cater to the multiple languages, we added a horizontal bar on top with languages um, so that speakers could self-identify versus a vertical drop-down, which we know doesn't work. To address the safety concerns, we explicitly state your number is safe with us instead of couching it under legal terms and conditions after really ensuring that the numbers were safe. We took the questions our participants asked us in our research studies and broke them down into simple Q&A like who's giving me the Wi-Fi? Why are you collecting my phone number? What are you going to do with it? And we learned that people skip long paragraphs of text, so we broke it down into simple chunks. On page rendering, we reduce latency, and uh, because we are, most of the recipient phones are low-end devices in the $40 to $50 uh, range, uh, we use CSS for layouts, give textual descriptions to images, and so on. Digital literacy varies a lot. Uh, technical terms like browser are not understood in this context. Uh, in our marketing material. Uh, so we learned that URLs are intuitively understood uh, as addresses to feed into browsers. So we state the URL, uh, railwire.co.in, uh, rather than terms like browser or captive portal. On a lighter note, even small images like this image, uh, details on this image got noticed. Uh, we got reactions like, why are people sitting on the floor? Where is the platform? They look too rural. They look like they're from North India. 
So we designed a diverse array of characters uh, with a platform and a bench. <laughs> and most importantly, we have Google Wi-Fi agents uh, teaching people how to log into the Wi-Fi and helping them connect for the first time and answering questions. It's a highly learnable experience, so once you do it for the first time, it's easy. Uh, many of the station businesses are now information hubs in our evaluative research, and they teach passengers on how to connect. So this inclusive design and research approach helped ensure that anyone can connect to the internet for the first time. Uh, as soon as a, a first-time internet user walks into a station, there is marketing collateral. There are these information hubs that they can walk into who will log into the Wi-Fi for them, and it's easy. So we launched the Wi-Fi network last year when Indian PM Modi visited Silicon Valley. It's set to become the world's largest at 400 stations. So today we have 6 million monthly users and counting. As far as we know, we have 15,000 daily completely new internet users uh, from villages to small businesses. So who's using the Wi-Fi? It's mostly students, informal sector, and SMBs. 72% hear about it through word of mouth. Uh, small and medium businesses, thanks. 4.5% um, here connect to the internet for the first time in our survey. And we also see that users use 400 MB per day on average when they're on this Wi-Fi service, which is 15 times more than the average data that they use when they're on 4G. So Quads has called it the best network in India. Most of the use cases are around high quality, uh, mo most, pa most passengers are using high-quality Wi-Fi for the first time. Most of the use cases are around streaming, downloading, updating um, apps, and it's a strong pattern of download and go, uh, particularly for the offline long-haul train rides, um, or to get music and movies to then share with friends and family later. So to be truly democratic, the design of public Wi-Fi networks needs to consider less resourced individuals who may get marginalized due to the embedded politics, such as literacies, affordability, safety, and inclusion. And a big lever for how this is introduced is through intermediaries. Public Wi-Fi was very much imagined as a public space. Uh, designers should avoid, to, avoid seeking intrusive personal information and provide security guarantees. Reliability and high speeds are at the core of the network experience. And contrary to most ICTD studies, cost savings alone was not sufficient to drive usage, especially when 2G was familiar and uh, although slow. So in the prior case studies, we see how human systems can overcome constraints, constraints of limited technological ownership, sensitive and confidential identities, trust in the source of information, the shape of the network, low awareness of the internet and sustainability of the intervention. Here's what I want to do in the future. I'm interested in expanding the unit of impact of human infrastructures. Typically, ICTD projects focus on individual gain or benefit, like microfinance payments or crop yield. But when we expand the lens to include broader social relations, say at a regional level, we are able to understand human infrastructures and the role they play in collective problems like crises, internet blackouts, or public goods, and how to design for these relations. I'm interested in developing an HCI vocabulary for developing contexts conceptually, analytically, and methodologically. In, two, in December 2015, there was a devastating flood in Chennai, a metropolitan city in the south of India, and we saw the emergence of a resilient human infrastructure. I'm briefly going to share some early results from this new piece of work. So the research questions here were, what is the ground level response during a crisis event in a developing city? How do socioeconomics intersect with the creation and reception of the response? How does the breakdown of technological and material infrastructure affect information and communication flows in crisis and post-crisis situations? So there were two spells of rain in November to December 2015 following the El Nino pattern. Water levels were the highest recorded in 100 years. Two states were affected, but particularly the city of Chennai was affected because it was on the coast. With very little warning, the government opened the gates of a water reservoir at 10 p.m. People were sleeping when their homes were flooded and water reached up to the ceiling. Over 500 human lives were lost with uh, the loss of several animals and plants. Uh, because the city is coastal, rainwater was flowing through the entire city uh, to drain into the ocean, carrying effluents and sewage and entering people's homes. Low-income families pretty much lost their lifetime's worth of savings and appliances. 
For a week, 60% of the city did not have electricity, and as, as a result of which, cell towers were also down because backup power was down. Fresh water supply, medicines, food, and fuel were cut off. Airports, hospitals, and mortuaries were shut down for a few days. And there was regional news coverage at that point. There was no national media coverage for a couple of weeks. So we conducted a field study a few months after the flood uh, with affected families and businesses and uh, spoke to eight volunteer groups that had formed during the time of the crisis, <coughs> including fishermen who helped out uh, with their boats. We also did an analysis of tweets from Twitter with two hashtags, Chennai Rains and Chennai Rains Help, which were curated by Twitter India during the time of the floods. A lot of crisis research examines the Twitter sphere, um, but since India has an internet penetration of 15 to 20%, depending on the source, we analyzed both the online and the offline spheres to understand what were the linkages and where they break down holistically. The government response was ineffective, slow, and weak. Citizens were not given warnings, and there was no advanced preparation. Help did not reach everybody. The party in power even took political advantage of the situation and uh, placed, uh, uh, plastered the, fee, uh, the face of the chief minister on relief packets. While the government response was inadequate, uh, what was remarkable was the civil society's response. Citizens rapidly mobilized into decentralized groups and efficiently plugged holes as needed. Altruism is higher during crisis events uh, consistently. Friends, co-workers, neighbors started a nucleus and quickly snowballed into volunteer groups. And most of the volunteers were regular citizens and not NGOs. The diaspora played a key role in the crisis um, from Bangalore, Hyderabad, and even in the Bay Area. Aid started pouring in entirely from citizens, but the coordination was decentralized. One of the most prominent efforts here started by citizens was a Google spreadsheet to gather relief requests and to channel supply. Uh, in the various groups, the lowest common denominator tools were used, which were mostly social media. Most of the city lost power, hence internet, so the offline structures led to the greatest impact. On the other hand, vast parts of Chennai, especially the lower income and lower caste areas, were disproportionately affected by the floods due to proximity to the water bodies and the, the reservoir, uh, but they did not have representation on Twitter. The red pins are the areas where we conducted field work in uh, some low-income communities by water bodies. The purple circles are areas where the tweets came from, which are the wealthier neighborhoods. And due to English language interfaces, lack of power, low technology skills, these areas were rendered invisible on social media. And in turn, relief efforts like the Google spreadsheet were targeted more towards wealthier neighborhoods. While citizen power is great, lack of coordination with the government led to gaps in relief, uh, especially in airlifting, airdrop of food and relief, emergency medical services, and so on. On Twitter and WhatsApp, fake news made an appearance. Messages on crocodiles escaping in the rainwater, tsunami alerts, a third round of rains is predicted by NASA, all caused a great deal of panic. What's interesting is that the Chennai Civic Corporation has not been online since 2012 on their Twitter account. When hurricanes happen here in the US, FEMA has a rumor control board set up since Hurricane Katrina, um, but there is no such government authority that is online in this case. Uh, when we analyze the top 50 most influential accounts using the hashtag Chennai Rains, 26 out of 50 were celebrities, that's film stars and cricket stars. And so they would tweet, and then their fan following would retweet to their friends. Uh, so they played the role of information hubs uh, in verifying information and tagging them with verified hashtags. Um, many messages were shared without verifying or with delays. Uh, in, in one particular case, it led to the death of a baby before help could get there. Natural crises like floods and earthquakes and man-made crises like terrorist attacks in developing countries share similar patterns. Information is paramount. Accuracy of information is key. Governments are weak or ineffective in many developing contexts. For inclusion, one has to consider low literacy and uh, no internet access or smartphones. Infrastructure may be entirely down or selectively working. Altruism is high and there is general panic. Yet human infrastructures are typically rich and thriving. How can we design decentralized crisis response tools for natural and man-made disasters? 
So here's a sketch of what future work could look like. The key problems are uh, need for relief information, like I need X, uh, public alerts and information, uh, such as what just happened, where should I go, where are my relatives, what are health alerts, the constraints that arise are that there's very little setup time. There's, it's not a time to download new software. It's a time to leverage existing tools. There's need for compatibility with multiple infrastructures, with several of them being down or unreliable. There's need for accuracy, and there's a need for simplicity. So if we borrow the principle of hierarchy from networking to naturally forming groups, uh, if we have a two-way information flow from uh, governments and NGOs at the top to hyper-local intermediaries who work with their communities at the bottom, with aggregators or volunteers in between, we can start to think about many use cases. For relief, information can be channeled from the communities to their intermediary who can then transmit to their aggregator. The channel could be an IVR, social media, SMS, depending on what infrastructure works. Uh, the aggregating service could be a web interface. It standardizes the content automatically or manually. Relief information could then be shared with various helpers. Similarly, if the government or the institution wants to pass messages to the citizens, such as the Ministry of Health about cholera outbreaks, it comes back through the aggregator and the intermediary who then share it with their hyperlocal networks, say with a watermark. Um, for information vetting, you could have weighted scores or critical mass to verify, similar to how independent entities can verify digital certificates on websites. And all of this needs to be very simple so that the system can be deployed and be up and running in a few minutes. Extending this work even further, I'm interested in studying and design, uh, designing for other variations of human infrastructures, such as active infrastructures in communities during access blackouts especially in democratic societies. Um, and dormant infrastructures, like in public goods problems of environmental degradation. When there is collective interest from a group from the ground up, as opposed to from the top down, welfare schemes, um, what are those human infrastructures like? What are the information and decision architectures? What types of incentives exist or need to be created? And where do they break down? Further, I'm interested in forward-looking ICTD, and by this I mean researching issues that emerging low and lower middle income users face, or will face, allowing us to understand longer time horizons and designing for devices and networks um, as prices drop. Another lens I want to continue to apply is how marginalized communities within these emergent, dormant, and active infrastructures get access for example, what are the sub-infrastructures of LGBTQ, which is criminalized in 76 countries, women, lower caste groups, and their relation to technology? Many have broken trust, apathy, and hopelessness. So how should design practices create a greater sense of empowerment? Uh, in many geopolitical contexts, citizens can be jailed for expressing their opinions, uh, especially dissent. So the challenge is how can technology in these various domains uh, play a role in protecting identities and creating safety, yet allowing a view into the outside world? As the next five billion people start using technology, and a majority of them come from developing countries, how should HCI and CSCW grow to create new constructs, methodologies, principles, metrics, and learn to work with new groups? I'm interested in contributing to this emerging vocabulary Specifically, what are methodologies to understand human infrastructures? How can we define, map, and analyze them? How can we measure success and failure? Crossover ideas from anthropology, behavioral economics, network sciences, and biology could be helpful here. It opens up a new chapter in both HCI and ICTD around design responses for various social fabrics and heterogeneous technology environments. Eventually, my hope is to change the conversation in HCI and make human infrastructure a core principle. In low-income environments, it is the core, and without it, nothing works. My hope is that in five to 10 years, human infrastructures will become a parameter of ICTD conferences and papers, a new field. For, from various research studies and deployments, if a playbook could be created so that development institutions, practitioners, nonprofits, and academics can follow the frameworks, my hypothesis is we could spend fewer cycles and fail less often. To recap, I started off by asking how can technology leverage human infrastructures and presented three examples from prior work on intermediation among slum community 
dwellers in Bangalore, strengthening existing inf uh, systems for information delivery for microfinance and healthcare among sex workers, and introducing a new access infrastructure at scale through human intermediaries. I shared some early results on crisis response during the Chennai floods and on how an emergent human infrastructure responded to local needs and outlined future work opportunities in an emergent, active, and dormant infrastructures. The resilient gap-filling and thriving human infrastructures overcome several resource constraints, provide skill bridges, and make development approachable. By starting with these human systems, the approach could change ICTD to a more grounded, sustainable endeavor, and we may truly have the impact we set out to have in the first place. So here are my awesome con con collaborators. <laughs>